Good day, this is Ann Windsor, and welcome to the reading of the book Two Kinds of Faith by E.W. Kenyon, Faith's Secret Revealed. Today we'll be covering chapter 6 and chapter 7, Some Enemies of Faith and Faith in Your Faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, giving eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the insights, Father, that Brother Kenyon is revealing through his words. And Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Chapter 6, Some Enemies of Faith This book would not be complete unless we revealed to you some of the beautiful enemies of faith. Hmm, beautiful enemies. Quite a paradox. The first one is hope. Hmm. You think, how could hope be an enemy of faith? Well, hope is always in the future. Such as, I hope that I will be healed. I hope that I will have money to meet my bills. I hope that I will have strength to do my work. Hope is really an enemy of faith. It stands in the way of faith. I say to you, will you be healed when I pray for you? And you reply, I hope so. That means you will not be healed. There is no healing in hope. As far as faith is concerned, hope is a delusion. Faith is always present tense. Therefore, because hope is always future, it is a hindrance to faith. We have a hope of heaven. When we reach heaven, we shall hope no longer. Takes some thinking on that one, doesn't it? But I think to really clarify what he's saying is here. If I say to you, will you be healed when I pray for you? In your reply, I hope so. That means you will not be healed. There is no healing in hope. As far as faith is concerned, hope is a delusion or illusion. Faith is always present tense. The next one. He lists as an enemy of faith is mental assent. Mental assent is another enemy, an adroit, dangerous enemy. Mental assent claims the whole Bible to be true. Mental assenters say they believe every word of it, but they do not act upon it. They simply assent to the fact that it is true. I was called to pray for a woman with cancer. Both she and her husband had been outstanding Bible teachers for years. As I sat by the bedside and opened the word, she kept saying, I have always believed that. I have known that scripture since I was a child. I went away from the house baffled and defeated. I could not understand where the difficulty lay. When I arrived home, I walked up and down my room saying, Lord, why is she not healed? She is a good woman. She says she believes your word and has been a teacher of it for many years. Then the Spirit made me see that she only mentally assented to the word. She didn't believe it. Believing is acting is acting on the word. 
she had never acted on the word for her healing. A few days later, I went to the house again. This time, I understood her case. As I began to open the word, she said, I have believed that all my life. I told her, No, you. No, you have never believed it. For if you had, you would be out of your bed doing your work. You only mentally assent to it. Whew. Then I opened the word again. She said, That's the truth. I don't believe it. I can see now how I have never believed it. I have always assented to it. You will find that in many cases where men and women have mental assent instead of faith, their creed or dogma has taken the place of the word's reality. Next, sense knowledge faith. Sense knowledge faith requires sense evidence. This is the kind of faith Thomas had when he said in John chapter 20 verses 20 to 4, 29, 24 to 29, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Then Jesus suddenly appeared to him and said, Reach hither thy finger, and see my hands, and reach hither thy side, thy hand, and put it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Here we see these two kinds of faith in contrast. There is a Bible faith and sense knowledge faith. The faith that Mary and Martha and the others had in Jesus during his earth walk was sense knowledge faith. They believed in Jesus because they saw the miracles he performed. The Jews said, What doest thou for a sign, that we may see thee and believe? This sense-knowledge faith has almost driven real faith out of the churches. This kind of faith does not give the word its rightful place. Men carry the word to church, but they do not trust it. They trust in their feelings in their emotions, and what they can see and hear, or taste or smell. Real faith is acting on the word independently of any sense evidence. There are two kinds of unbelief. The first is based on lack of knowledge. The man does not believe the word because he knows nothing about it. So, he does not believe in the Father's revelation to him. A great number of unbelievers are ignorant of the things to believe. They do not know, so they cannot believe. The second type of unbelief is mentioned in Hebrews 4.11. It is unpersuadableness. Hebrews 4.11 reads, Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest, that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. The Greek word is translated unbelief in the King James Version. It is disobedience in the American Revised and means unpersuadableness. This means that the man is unwilling to allow the word to govern him. It is a refusal to act on the word. He knows what the word teaches, but he refuses to act on it. Believing is an act of the will. He can act on the word if he will. Believing is willing to do his will. 
Disobedience is an unpersuadable attitude toward the word. Then unbelief is either ignorance of the word or unpersuadableness to act upon it. Chapter 7 Faith in Your Faith Faith in your own faith is the law of success in the realm of the spirit. You live in the word and the word lives in you. The word capital W, meaning the Word of God, the Bible, is a living thing. When you let it loose in you, it is letting God loose in you. When you dare to act the Word and speak the Word, God will be in the words that you speak. As the Word gains the ascendancy, there will be an unconscious faith in your own ability to trust him. You will trust him utterly. You will go to the limit of his word. It is a beautiful thing when a man abandons himself to the word of God, swings utterly free, and lets God loose in him until greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world becomes a thrilling reality. 1 Corinthians 2.12 tells us that we have received the Spirit, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us of God. It reads, But we received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that were freely given to us of God. Get to know your place, your rights, your privileges, and your authority. There will be no problem about faith then. Faith is a problem only when we do not know the Lord and we do not know the Word. Give place to the God inside of you. Reckon on the God inside of you. In the morning before you arise, say, I can do that because he is inside of me. He will enable me to meet these people. He will enable me to speak the word. He will enable me to walk in love, because greater is love within me than jealousy and hatred around me. Just reckon on the God inside of you. Plan your work with the consciousness of his ability in you to put you over. He has become a living reality. He is in there now. He awaits your demands upon him. He unveils himself as your need demands it. You are expecting him to guide you into all truth or reality. Whenever you take up the word for a few minutes, you know that the light inside of you will open the word and make it a living thing. You know John 16:13 is absolutely true. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into all truth. He will make the father's things he will take the father's things and unveil them to you. You have unconscious confidence in the name when spoken through your lips. You know that if you say, In the name of Jesus, demon, come out of that man or woman, that he will come out. You know when you command that disease to stop being, that it will stop being. You know. When you take the name of Jesus Christ for finances to meet an obligation that as sure as the Father sits on his throne, the money will come. You know his word in your lips will save the lost, heal the sick, 
give courage and strength to the weak and victory to the defeated. Once it was God's word in Jesus' lips. Now it is God's word in your lips. Jesus believed in God's word in his lips. Your confidence in that word makes it a living thing in your lips. How rich and beautiful life becomes when the word gains the ascendancy in our hearts. It will be a great day to you when you know that your faith does things. When you believe in your own ability to reach the ear of love, capital L. When you believe in your own ability to reach the ear of love. When you know that your prayers are answered, that God hears you. You are no longer dependent on another's faith. You have your own. Oh, say it over and over again. At last, I have faith in my own faith. I can reach God as well as anyone else. If a loved one is stricken, you fearlessly take your rights and deliver them from the enemy. Your prayer prevails. Your faith wins. You can use the name of Jesus as well as anyone now. That name is yours at last, with its all authority, and you dare use it as your own. He gave you the right to use it, and you were doing it. Knowledge is of no value unless you know how to use it. You know your standing with the Father. You know your privileges. Oh, now act your part. Faith in others' faith. The largest percentage of those who are healed in mass meetings, where they have mass faith, seldom ever maintain their healing. The reason is obvious. They have no personal faith. It is just faith in other people's faith. During our last trip to Los Angeles, a Christian worker, who had been greatly used of the Lord, said to me, I cannot understand why my prayers for some of my old friends are not heard. They used to be healed every time I prayed for them. I said, The difficulty lies in the fact that when by reason of time those sick people ought to be praying for the sick themselves, they need someone else to pray for them. Just as the Spirit says in Hebrews 5.12, For when by reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have need again that someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. For everyone that partaketh of milk is without experience, in the work of righteousness, for he is a babe. Everyone that partaketh of milk, that is, lives in the realm of the senses, and is dependent upon sense evidence instead of the word, has had no experience in the word of righteousness. He is still a babe. What does it mean? Those people who have been healed by someone else's faith for years, have reached a place where God demands that they have faith of their own. If they are unwilling to study the word, unwilling to develop their faith life, they will turn to the, quote, arm of the flesh and suffer the penalty that naturally follows. God expects every one of us to have experience in the word of righteousness. In other words, that we have experience of our own in praying for sick folks, in proclaiming the word, in leading men to Christ, in unveiling the word. That belongs to every believer. Colossians 1.12 reads, Giving thanks unto the Father, who made us meet or able 
to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Here is a better translation. Giving thanks unto the Father who has given us the ability to enjoy our share of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered you out of the authority of darkness. He has recreated your spirit. Now he is ready to renew your mind so that you may understand your privileges and rights in Christ. It belongs to you. You have a right to it. You should enjoy it instead of being dependent upon someone else's faith. You have a faith of your own now. Oh, what an hour it would be if those who read this book should declare, By the grace of God, I will have faith in my own faith. You have a right to it. It belongs to you. You have the same Holy Spirit that I have. The same Holy Spirit that Jesus had and that the apostles had. You have the same eternal life, the same righteousness, the same ability. The Father has no favorites. All these things belong to every one of us, so we need not be barren or unfruitful. 2 Corinthians 9.8 reads, And God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that you, having always all sufficiency in everything, may abound unto every good work. And in the tenth verse he says, And he that supplieth seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. You have the righteousness that is imparted to you in the nature of the Father at the new birth. That righteousness should be bearing fruit in your daily life. You should take advantage of the fact of your legal standing before the throne, of your rights in Christ, and begin to pray for the sick and the needy. You have the same legal standing before God that Paul had, and you have the same righteousness that he had. There is no excuse to hide your light beneath a bushel. Begin to witness of what you are in Christ. Hallelujah. That concludes the reading of chapter 6 and chapter 7. Join me the next time for chapter 8, Corresponding 